Um, I'm coming from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and the title of my message this morning is, if God be for us, then who can be against us? If God be for us, then who can be against us? And I came to speak to you about God is fighting for you. He's fighting for his relationship with you. That's right. He's fighting for your family. <laughs> Even when you're sleeping, he doesn't slumber and he doesn't sleep. Yes, yes. He's still fighting on your behalf. So whatever you might be facing, whatever you might be going through, it's not too big for our God. And the reason why I came to this passage is because one day I was going through something and I had a lot of questions for the Lord. I was like, Lord, why? Why me? Why is this happening to me? God, are you really there? So let's get real. <laughs> are you really there? Do you see this circumstance? Do you see this situation that's presented itself before me? God, do you hear my cry? Because I don't see. But faith sees beyond your circumstance and sees beyond your situation. And you need to know something this morning. And know that if God be for you, then who can be against you despite what surrounds you Amen. at that moment? Mm -hmm. And I want to remind you this, that God is not intimidated by our questions. That's right. Amen. He's not intimidated <laughs> by our humanity. He's not angry with your questions. <laughs> he actually says those who... Seek wisdom to ask. Yeah. And that he'll give it freely to us. So he's not intimidated. I feel like sometimes we beat ourselves up. Because we're like, well, God, why is this happening? And that we shouldn't be questioning God. No, you know what? We're human and sometimes we're going to question God. But never question his character. Yes, Because yes. his character doesn't change. He can't go against who he is. He is good, and he is just, and he is faithful. Feed upon the faithfulness of God. And when you forget the faithfulness of God, recall back to your mind the times that he has been faithful over and over and over and over again. Because the enemy will cloud your mind and your own doubts and fears will cloud your mind that he's not going to be faithful. But can you tell me a time that God hasn't come through for you? Maybe not in your time and when you want it. But God will always show up. And it will be exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask and more than you can think. So this morning, I just want to refocus. Refocus our eyes and our hearts and our attention back to the Lord. Because there's so many distractions. There are so many things that and circumstances that press on us that distract us and we're feel, we feel like we're being overcome by our circumstance. But I wanted to remind us this morning because I needed to remind myself that if God be for us, yes. then who can be against us? Yes, Lord. The scripture reads, and we know that all things, not some things, all things work together for the good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Jump to verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? He that spared not his own 
son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Father, I pray you just have your way. God, that you speak through me. God, that you anoint me. Lord, that I only speak that which you desire for me to say. God, and we'll be careful, Lord, to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to set the stage for a minute. This book was written by Paul, and it was like, the Romans is a road map to our relationship with Christ. So if you haven't dug deep in the book of Romans, I suggest that you begin to read it and read it over and read it over and read it over again because it's the reality of Christian living in this book. And he goes through the chapters and he proves that all men are guilty before God. He proves that we're justified, that we're legally declared innocent before God. He proves that by faith in Christ and him crucified, <laughs> that we are being sanctified, we are being daily changed. And then he says, don't forget what I just taught you because you're going to need to apply it to your life. So we need to know what's in the book of Romans. And this chapter sits in the middle of a sanctification chapter. So the changing of our lives. So I want to remind you of God before us and who can be against us. But reality of Christian living is we're still in this human form and we're going to face some things. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be things that we come up against. This isn't prosperity where things are always going to be great and always going to be grand. We're going to have situations on our job. We're going to have situations in our home. We're going to have situations when we're driving here today and the GPS is driving us in circles. And we're like, are you serious? This is our fourth time being there and we just can't get there. You know, that can ruin you someone's day if you let it. Little things, yeah, yeah. little things that come to spoil your day or come to spoil that joy that's within you. Practical Christian living. Yes. When you wake up in the morning and you just don't want to get out of bed or you just don't want to go to work and face those people that you got to show the love of Jesus to Amen. every single right. day. And you know they don't like you and they, you know they talk behind your back and you know, and you know these things. And you know that you're surrounded. Sometimes you just feel you're like you're surrounded by the enemy. But remember that if God be for us, then who can be against us? Yes. And leading up into this paragraph where we're at, it says in verse 26, that likewise the Spirit also helps in our infirmities. And I don't know about you, but I am not a super Christian and I don't claim to be one, and I have weaknesses, and I have frailties, and I have bad days, and I have things that take me, my mind and my focus and my heart off course. And these infirmities, these things that we face, it says we might not even know how to pray for those things. And thank God for the Spirit of God. Thank God for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Thank God when I don't know what to pray, that he knows how to pray through me, and he knows how to meet that need. But right here in this verse, he's not even speaking of that. He goes further to say, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And I want to ask you something this morning. Have you ever been in a situation or a circumstance or something going on that you can't even express yeah. the depth? <clears throat> it's just so down deep yeah. or that wound <laughs> is so deep that you can't even express it out of your mouth. Right. Or you're so afraid or something's go. The pressure is so enclosed <coughs> around you that all you can do is groan inside. Mm -hmm. That might be all you can get out is a groaning. But the moment that you said yes to Jesus Christ, 
the Holy Spirit took up residence within you and he's there to make intercession for you. So the blood of Jesus still speaks over your life. Even when we don't know what to say. Even when we don't know where to go. Sometimes I just got to sit down and say, Jesus. Just Jesus. That's all I can get out. And I know I'm loud and when I pray I'm loud. And But you know what? Sometimes all I can do is just Jesus. Just Jesus. And you know what? The Spirit of God knows what I mean. That's right. Amen. That's right. He knows what I mean, and He knows how to meet that very need. So from that moment that you said yes to Jesus, you have everything that you need to live a victorious Christian life. Everything. Everything that you need. From the moment you said yes to Jesus. But it's kind of like getting my, I got a new phone, and I don't know how to use the whole thing. <laughs> That's okay. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to treat myself, and I'm going to get this really nice phone, but I don't know how to use everything in every app that's in the phone. I'm ignorant to some things that are in the phone, and it re reminds me that's kind of like how we come to the Lord. We didn't know. We don't know anything when we come to Jesus. We just know that we're sinners, and we need a Savior. And then but God invests his spirit in us and we have everything we need at that moment to live victorious. What a beautiful thing. But then we need to learn how to access what we have. So just like I need to get on the phone and play with it and figure it out and read the instructions and read the manual and ask somebody else, can you figure this out for me? Thank God for the body of Christ. Yes. When we can go to one another and say, hey, I don't understand this, or I don't know what's going on, or I don't know how to face this thing, and we can say, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what God did for me. Right. Let me tell you how he met my need. Let me explain the scripture to you. Let me show you. Thank God for that. And I want to remind you that greater is he that is in you than he who is in this world. So whatever you need this morning, if you need strength, he's there. If you need victory, he's there. If you need provision, he's there. I'm talking about things that you wake up in the morning on your heart and on your mind and you're worried and you're fretful. And he's saying, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. I'm going to meet that need. And it's that groaning, that thing that's in the pit of your stomach. See, he's set in the stage to tell you that all things work together yes. for the good. Hallelujah. See, he's saying, I see your groaning. I see it. Didn't escape my eye. That's why I went to Calvary. And I, as I was preparing this, there was a couple songs that stuck, stuck out to me. And one of them, it's called No Weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I know that's scripture, but there's also a song and it says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It won't work. It won't work. So whatever has come against you, I'm declaring this morning that it won't work. Then it comes to say, God will do what he said he will do. He's not a God that he shall lie. He will come through. So if you don't know the song, look it up. Because it's really good. And he continues to say it and say it. He said, God will do what he said he will do. He will stand by his word. He will come through. Amen. So when you don't know what to do, open up the word of God Amen. and encourage yeah. yourself in the Lord because there he will meet you there. He will encourage you there. He will solidify his word in your heart. And it said, we shall know that all things work together for the good. The Spirit, He stands in intercession for us. And I am not going to pronounce this Greek word because it's like this long. But 
It says to intercede on the behalf, to stand in the gap for. See, his blood stands in the gap for you. If we sin, his blood stands in the gap for you. If we fall, his blood stands in the gap for you. If we need peace, his blood stands in the gap for you. But not only is he an intercessor, but it also says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. An advocate is a counselor, it's a parakletos, which comes from the word paraclete. Robert, will you come here for a second? You guys know I like using examples, so here we go. Um, paraclete means one that is called, over here, Robert, for me. One that is called alongside to help you in every circumstance, in every situation. It, it's a representation of the Holy Spirit. It also says in Hebrews, wherefore receiving the kingdom which cannot be moved. <clears throat> receiving the kingdom is paralambano. So listen, when we receive Christ, we receive the paraclete, which is the one that is called alongside to help us. Yeah. But not only do, rec do we receive the one that is called alongside to help us, but we also receive the kingdom of God, which is paralambano, which means to join rib to rib. Amen. Yes, yes. So wherever I go and whatever I do, thank God Robert's bigger than me. I got a, I got a big God. I got a God that can fight for me and fight on my behalf. And once you're joined to Christ, Rib to rib, yeah. it's a union, right. it cannot right. be broken, it right. cannot be shaken, no matter what you go through or what you face. So you receive the king thank you. <laughs> you receive the kingdom of God. You receive all that he has for you. I was reminded of the psalm, as a deer pants after water, so my soul longs after you. Have you ever been in a circumstance and it's just dry and you're like, Lord, as I need water. Lord, I need a touch of your spirit. Lord, I need you to move. Oh God, as a deer pants after water, so my soul longs after you. But it continues to go on to say deep cries out to deep. And I'm reminded, and it says, the water spouts go over you. And have you ever been at a water park and, like, flipped off your tube or something like that where it's just like you're rolling? Or even in the beach, I've gotten taken down by waves and roll yeah. under the water. And that's the picture that it's giving you, that you feel like things are flipped out of control and your life is upside down. And But deep is crying out to deep. You can't utter the word, but the, the paraclete is along your side. You're paralambano with him. And you're rib to rib, and you know that he's there, but you're just flipping out of control. And that inner groaning comes in deep distress and pressure. But then it continues to go on in the psalm to say, Yet the Lord commanded his loving kindness over me. His, the Lord commanded. So what yet? Yet the Lord. So it did not escape his eye. What you're facing does not escape his eye. And then in Romans 8, 27, to continue to set the stage, it says, He that searches the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he that make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I, I think I have to remind myself <laughs> that what we face daily is according to, to the will of God. Now we can make stupid decisions and stupid yes. choices that might not have been within the will of God, but thank God for a God that redirects our path and places us back on the path of righteousness sake. But his desire is for you to do his will. His desire 
And the Holy Spirit's job is to carry out the will of God in your life. That's what he wants to do. So then it goes on to say, and we know. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. When you know something, it's not a passing thought. Yeah. It's not one in, in one ear and out the other ear. Do you know that the sun's going to rise in the morning? Yeah. It's going to rise. You know that it's going to rise. Do you know that gravity is going to keep you grounded and keep you sturdy and keep you down? Well, the same thing with the Lord. The gravity of the Spirit of God will keep you grounded and will keep you rooted and will keep you sturdy where you should be. And we know. Something that Naya was singing this morning was, he's a way maker. Do you know? Think about it. Do we really know when we see that thing before our face that he's a way maker and that he's going to make a way? Do we know that he's a miracle worker? <clears throat> Cancer has got to go in the presence of God. Sickness has got to go in the presence of God. Our family members that are way, way off or backslidden, they're going to come back because he's a miracle worker for the kingdom of God. I believe in that this morning. It's not something that I want to be a fleeting thought. I want it to be in the highest of highest of trials and know my God is a way maker. Know my God is a miracle worker. Know my God is a promise keeper. That he's in, if I'm in darkness, there's still light in my darkness because he's there with me. I'm going to believe that this morning. And I don't want to just know it up here. I want to know it in here because in here is where it's going to carry me through. Then the song continues to see, says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. You might not see it today, but one day your eyes are going to see his glory. And I promise yes. you that because he promises yes. you that. Yes. And I'm going to stand on the word yes. of God because that's all I have in this world. <clears throat> that's all I have is to hold on to the word of God and say, God, you said it. And I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to stand on it. And I'm going to hold on to the horns of the altar. And I'm not going to let go. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're a way maker. Mm. Think about this. I was just talking to Miss Bridget before um, church started. And I was thinking about Joseph. This man of God. That God gave a vision to. Mm. And he ends up being in a pit. Isolated, in darkness, despised, and you're talking about a man of God. We're talking about the people of God. Yeah. Rejected, wounded, alone. So we can throw out, you know, prosperity gospel and all those different things because this man of God was in the pit, rejected by his own brothers, wounded and alone. <clears throat> he was sold into slavery and betrayed. We're talking about God working all things together for the good. Amen. And when you look at this, you're like, man, this is some rough stuff. Potiphar's house, falsely accused, prison, captivity behind bars, then to the palace. Well, I have good news for you. You are in preparation for your palace. Whatever that may be. And however that might look, you are in preparation for your palace. And God is going to work that all together for the good. Because in the end, Joseph not only had enough to feed his own family,
family, but feed the nation. He had a storehouse that he was able to feed the people with. Because in the pit, I don't read anything about him murmuring or complaining right. or, or coming against or accusing God or walking away from God. I mean, he was human, so I'm sure he felt it. But his faith stayed anchored. It stayed anchored in the one who called him, in the one who revealed himself to him. So you are in this process of preparation. And you know what the people said? Every time they seen Joseph, they said the spirit of the Lord is upon him. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. People in the world said the spirit of the Lord is upon him. They didn't even know what the spirit of God was. They said the spirit of the Lord is upon him. Because Joseph allowed these circumstances and these situations to work for him. And that's why God, are, are we willing? Are we, are we willing? And sometimes I know that it doesn't always feel like God is working it together. But when I don't see it, he's working. When I don't feel it, he's working. In Potiphar's house in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is called by God to go down. It says descend. To go down to where Potiphar's house was. And it was dark and muddy and nasty. And he said, peer into the window and watch the potter work. And we're the clay. And he's the potter. And we're placed on the wheel. See, the potter was diligently working on his creation. You know what I love about a potter? If you've ever seen someone do it or have done it yourself, you never take your hands off of the clay. You're constantly working, constantly moving, trimming. And two of the, I studied this a while back because I had preached on it, but he called Jeremiah there to hear the word of God and Potiphar Meet the potter's house meant you star, and it meant squeezing into shape or form or molding. Squeezing. So the potter at times have to squeeze and mold and shape our lives, and it's not in a comfortable place. He called them down to a dark and a muddy place to see this. And he didn't even say just, just hear the word of God. He said, see, behold it. So you're going to see this work that he's doing in your life. And the pot, it's called pulling. And pulling defies gravity. So when you're pulling, the, when you're working on the pot, it's the inside pressure and the outside pressure working against one another to pull the pot up mm -hmm. to make it grow. It defies gravity gravity so it defies it comes against everything our natural man right, right. wants Amen. Jesus. and it causes us <laughs> to grow because it's the spirit of God working on the inside with the outside circumstances and situations and pressures of life as we place our faith in him causing us to grow but I want to encourage you this morning that if you are in the potter's house Praise him. Praise him in the pain. Praise him in the darkness. Praise him in the process. Begin to praise God. Because when you begin to praise God, it lines you up with him. It lines you up with Calvary. Because then you begin to just thank him. And everything else, if you know anything about praise, is when you praise God, everything else begins to fade away and fall away. And all of a sudden, you're in the presence of God and everything else seems dim. Yeah. Even the darkest of circumstances Amen. begin to fade away in the presence of God. So I'm encouraging you this morning, begin to praise Him. Because when we begin to praise Him, I had to ask myself, what about all these other men and women of God, Daniel thrown in the lion's den, but, but God shut the mouth of the lion. Yes. See, he worked it out 
for his good and for his glory. Throw him to the lion's den, but the lion's mouths were shut to show that he was God. Yes. Jonah ran from the call of God upon his life, ended up in the belly of a whale, but God redirected his path. He wants to show that he is able to shut the mouth of the lion, that he's able, if you get off track, to redirect your path, even if he has to send a whale and a storm to swallow you up. Yes. Esther, taken from the comfort of her own home, being put in the palace. Why? Because God wanted a whole nation of Israel to be saved, and she was going to be the only one to do it. But God... When Lazarus died, Jesus said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. See, but God yes. wants to show up even in a situation that seems like it's death. Job lost his family lost his land, lost his livelihood. His wife turned to him and said, curse God and die. It seemed like no one was on his side. His friends were accusatory. And God said, though you slay me, yet I will trust him. Yes. It was all for God's glory. So Satan's effort in these circumstances and situations are to get our eyes off of him. That's what I was talking about in the beginning. To refocus where our eyes are set. Are we looking at the outward circumstances and situations and being overwhelmed and swallowed up by them? Or do we need to redirect our focus and look back to the blood and look back to the master and look back to the one that is for us and, and who can be against us? <laughs> These trials we face daily, but it says in Romans 8, 29, For whom he did not foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. What's the purpose of this trial? That was the question. That we be conformed into the image of his Son. And I just want to hit this and move on. That predestinate does not mean that God chose some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. Right. That is not what that means. And that, and that scripture is taken and it is twisted. And that's not what that means. It means that God knew in advance who would choose him. And his goal was to conform them into his image. Mm -hmm. He already knew in advance. But the scripture says... That the spirit of the bride said, come, and let him who hears say, come, and him who thirsts, come, and whosoever will, right. come. Yeah. So he doesn't want to leave any behind. Yeah. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he loved the world. Yes, yes. So he didn't predestine some to go and, and others to not go. That is not our God. And people aren't going to twist that scripture and say that that is our God. No, our God says that he desires that none shall perish and that all shall come. He wants all to come. Therefore, he chose us to be conformed into his image, to be a resemblance. So why am I in this trial? To be like Jesus. So others can see Jesus so others can see the grace of God upon our lives. So others can say, like, they seen Joseph, the spirit of the Lord is upon him. Now, will you come here for a second? Come on, Naya. I have this mirror. This way. I don't think we'll be able to get it in the camera. That's okay. Hold it. That's it, man. It is? Okay, awesome. So to be conformed into his image. And I started thinking. I was like, okay, Lord, my hands. Let them work for you. Yes. And that doesn't always mean that everyone's going to...
going to be behind a pulpit. And, and No, where are you at? Where God put you? See, we're not all going to be great evangelists and different things. What about your job? I make sandwiches for a living. Yes. Okay? And can God use me there? Can God, I mean, we've had people come in and we've prayed for cancer right in the middle of the restaurant. And we've seen God move yes, in the middle of a sandwich shop in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Because I'm saying, God, no wherever I'm at, let my hands be used for your glory. Let me do it for your glory. My feet. And then I was like, okay, well, it's not just my hand that needs to resemble Christ. Mm, that's good. I'm like, my feet, where I go, where I walk, what I pursue after. Is God calling me to pursue those things or go that way? So my feet, are my feet resembling Christ? But Hannah, do you wake up in the morning and stand in front of the mirror like this, one hand, one foot, and you just check out your outfit that way, right? No, we, we don't do that. So then our head. Does what we think about, does what we look at, do what, does what we read, does it resemble Christ? And I'm not talking about works. Because out of your relationship with Christ, he will change your heart yeah. and it will just flow out of you. But are you, are you presenting yourself to the Lord for him to change those things in you? Mm -hmm. What we think about, does it look like Christ? Sabrina, I know you did not get up this morning with a hand like this and a foot like this and a head like this in a mirror. Like, and just try to check out what was going on. Nobody does that. Your whole being, your whole body needs to be presented to the Lord. He wants to change everything about us from where we go, what we do, the way we talk, the attitude that we might have, the attitude towards Christ in a trial that we might have. Think about some things or some places in our heart that we might even get angry about being in the situation that we're in. See, that's what he wants to change. That's what he wants to surrender. That's what he wants to do is change our mindset and the way that we think about even him. See, because if God, we need to know if God be for us, then who can be against us? So when we're looking in the mirror and the reflection comes out, are other people seeing Christ? Yes. That's good. That was his goal. Thank you. That was his goal to change your whole being. If God be for us, then who can be against us? He, Paul says in 31, what shall we say to these things? Paul is not asking a question. Well, he is asking a question, but his question is meant to provoke you to get your attention. Yeah. What shall we say then to these things? Are you, are, do we have a proper perspective? Can we see ahead with eyes of faith, believing that he can work things out for his, our good and his glory. Can we see far beyond the current difficulties and say, God, I know that you're going to show up and I know that you're going to meet this need. God gives grace to the humble. He will give you grace. He will reflect his power in your heart when you don't think you can stand anymore. When you humble yourself before God and say, God, I can't, but I know that you can. I can't take one more step, but I know that you can give me grace and power. I see that thing in my life that has been there for years that I want to change, but God, you're for me, and I know that you're going to change it in me, because his power is then, when we look at Calvary and we look at the blood, only then, only then, when you look strictly to the blood and to Calvary can the grace of God flow in your heart and your life to give you grace to go through we need grace in this day and age we need grace to continue to move forward I, I need grace every day of my life yes grace to that mountain grace to that thing
saying, grace, if God be for us, was translated sense. So don't look at it as a question, if God be for us. No, sense, God is for us. Yeah. See, we, we come to know that your circumstance and their, your situation is being worked out for his good, for our good and his glory. And we know that we're on the right track because we looked at the men and women of the Bible and they had been through some stuff. I'm glad I wasn't thrown in the lion's den. But since he is for us, <coughs> but when God says, I'm for you, the enemy comes in and he says, did God really say that? Think about that. The lie from the beginning, from the garden, so yeah, I can get a witness over here. <laughs> The, God, the lie from the Garden of Eden, it said, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said? Did God really say that he was going to work it out for your good and his glory? Did he really mean that he was going to come through? Look at the state and the condition that you're in now. Man, he can be relentless. But I serve God who is much greater and much bigger than every lie that the enemy can sow. And that's why it's so important that we know something. Amen. And that we stay in the word and let it grow richly in our hearts to carry us through. Satan's scheme is to bring you doubt Fear, anxiety, overwhelming unbelief make you look in a wrong direction. Has anybody ever had a kid or even themselves ride a bike and then like when you look this way, your handlebars begin to go that way? Micah, how about on your motorcycle? You look that way and your bike begins to go that way? Well, that's what happens in our walk and in our journey with the Lord. When we begin to stare at something too long, it will lead yeah. us in that direction. Yeah. And that's why I think the Lord wanted me to come here this morning and say, let's refocus. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look back to the blood of Jesus. Oh, let's yeah. look back to whence cometh my help. Because oh, my help cometh from the Lord. Yeah. To remind you this morning that if God be for you, then who can be against you? And his goal and his plan of the Holy Ghost is to make his will in your life. And to be conformed into his image. Remi I want to remind you that the creator of heaven and earth is for you. Amen. That the one who hung every star and named it is for you. That the one that opened the Red Sea is for you. That the one that set the very course of existence, he's for you this morning. This is not a fairy tale. This is real. He Amen. is real. He is fighting for Amen. you and your family and everyone in it and everyone you see around you. It's real. The great I am is for you this morning. And you need to know that. You need to make it personal. You need to forget about everyone else that is sitting next to you. And you need to know for yourself God. that God is for you. Yes, yes. Because we can't ride on the coattails of someone else's faith when everyone else, when no one else is around. We have to know for ourselves. We have to have a personal relationship with God for ourselves. Naya, if you could come back. And if we could all stand. I want to close with this. <coughs> that he spared not his only son. When Christ hung on the cross, that was an expression of him saying, I'm for you. Yes. When he hung on that cross and shed his blood, he was saying, I'm for you. I want you. Come to me.
with all your difficulties, with all your struggles, with everything that's going on, because I'm hanging on this cross, because I want a relationship with you, and I am for you. That was an expression of his love. This is that love. This is that love that we need to remember and refocus and recall on. That he spared not his only son. That he gave heaven's best. That he shed his blood. That he bought you with a price. And that blood does not change. And our God does not change. Despite what it looks like. And despite how you might feel. He was delivered up for you. Yes, yes. For you. For you. For your children. For your families. He was delivered up for you. So how can we believe for a moment that a God that sent his only son to die a gruesome death, to shed his blood for us, that he's not for us? How can we even think that for a moment? And I understand. But I'm here to remind you of what he's done for you. That he's working it out for your good. So if God be for us, then who can be against us? I want to close with this. How can the heart and the hands who gave his most precious fail us now? How can the heart and the hands who shed his blood and was nailed to the cross, how could he fail us now?